just when I bow down on my knees. Now my heart is overflowing with his love. And I'm redeemed. I'm singing a new song. I'm redeemed. Singing a new song. By the blood of Jesus Christ, I've been redeemed. I've been born into God's family. My soul is saved. I've been set free. I have been redeemed. See, uh, let me make a let me make a count here. Lily, Karen, Candy, George, Emily, Maddie, Suver, John, me, Jolie, Shannon, April. Twelve. We're on a roll. Feels so good now. I could really preach now. Man. There's a discussion over 11 or 12 people. I remember when we felt bad when there was only 30 or 40. Yeah. 
Amen. Well, tonight, a lengthy message that you all deserve, right? Amen. All these half hour and 40 minute messages, amen. <sighs> Go to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Uh, we are going to preach about Nebuchadnezzar's autobiography. <laughs> what does that mean, auto, self? That means that someone wrote about themselves. So in the book of Daniel, chapter 4, is Nebuchadnezzar's autobiography. And it's important, this autobiography, with all the things he mentions. And I, when the fellow said he wrote it, I never <laughs> looked at it like that. And then I read the start, the middle, and at the end I'm saying, my goodness, he wrote this. God allowed him to, what's going on here? I never, I really didn't never consider it. Some will probably argue about it, but amen. Let's pray. Father, we appreciate you. We pray that you be with Richard, Father, in the hospital, and God, once again, we, we supplicate, we beg that you allow him to have one good kidney uh, so he doesn't have to have all that dialysis, which is wearing him out. Uh, we are thankful for John being here with us tonight and for Brother Suver, and God, you're still giving him some energy and God allowing them to be here, and we appreciate that. Not that we don't appreciate everybody being here. We pray to be with April with her job interview tomorrow that she gets the job, and uh, we're thankful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, make me some comments here first. Every day, gifted, intelligent, healthy, free-thinking Americans exchange these qualities in their lives for the lesser value, the base things, the corrupt things. Sin serves the unholy, undisciplined, the old nature. When one makes an emotional commitment to a position, truth and common sense mean nothing. Therefore, rule your emotions and manage your thinking. The greatest thing you can give yourself is being real and serving a real God. What does that mean? That you know who you are and stop trying to be like everybody else and you know God exists and he's real. I mean, those two things going together, you can, man, you can charge hell with a squirt gun, I imagine, right? Because you stop being like everybody else. You recognize God saved you for who you are and God's real. He saved you. I mean, those two things, you, I think you can take to the bank no matter how depressed you are, no matter how many times you go back on the Lord knowing who you are, and he knows, right? Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we do. But he's always there. We can always come back to him. Always ask him for help. Say we're sorry. I think, man, I don't know what else deal you can get out of that. But that's a pretty good thing to understand and to think about. Uh, the greatest thing you can give yourself is that transparency. Uh, we mess up enough by accident. We don't need to <laughs> plan it by forgetting God in our life. Listen, everyone tells someone, always remember this, please. Emily, Maddie, especially your age and everything. Well, no, I can't say that, I've been pastoring too long. But listen to this. Everyone tells someone. And when they do, they always enhance the original version. Remember, it's not reputation, but character we're concerned about. More people commit suicide over reputation than anything else. Teenagers in school and everything, all somebody's got to do is say a lie about a girl or even guys now. And uh, they get so depressed and discouraged and are so worried about what everybody thinks about them, even though they know their self it wasn't true. But they allow that to, that's their demise. And it's the same thing with adults. We're, we're so prone uh, to the reputation. Who cares? You know? I mean, really. Uh, you think about, what did Jesus say? He's a man of no reputation. Didn't mean he didn't exist. Didn't mean people didn't talk about him. But uh, he'd care less about that, right? Because he knew who he was. He wasn't messing up. He wasn't doing this. He wasn't doing that. So I'm just telling you, because once you whisper something to somebody, by the time it gets around to somebody else, it's blown out. It is just flat out blown out. You find all this in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, 
autobiography? Yeah, yeah, it's all in there. Somewhere it's in there. We're going to find all this stuff, I'm telling you. It's exciting. So understand this. King Nebuchadnezzar ruled most of the known world. That's a big deal. In the process, he had conquered Judah and brought a servant of the only true God into his court, Daniel. Daniel was a successful problem solver for the king. If you start Daniel and you just start reading through, you're going to see whenever the king needed something, he tried his magicians, his soothsayers, his, you know, heathens. They couldn't come across with the goods. Daniel could. And uh, Daniel was there for him. So you need to understand that. Chapter 4, we see the retelling of the event by the king. All right. I'll get back to my notes, but we're going to read here in, Nebuch in uh, uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. If you look at verse 1, the way he talks, he talks like Paul. You see this? There's something, something changed with this king, right? He wants everybody to know something. Verse 2. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, when I read, when I read Daniel and I go through, a lot of times, Brother George, I'll just read this, and I'll, I won't even pay attention to this, what, the guy talking. I get right in, I just keep reading. And I miss that this is his person. He's doing the talking. So it's not Daniel. And I'm just saying that because I'm excited because that's the first time I've, I've never crossed my mind he wrote this. He's so involved in it. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was <laughs> at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Anybody been there? I have. It's called nightmare. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Now, when we think about that, and even like with Egypt and other things, Pharaoh, I mean, when he got guys, believe me, these guys must have been pretty sharp. These kings didn't put up with that stuff. If Pharaoh, if you messed up Pharaoh, chop your head off. Nebuchadnezzar right here, when he's talking about his wise counsel, these guys must have had something going for him. You know, they must have somehow helped him out before in his conquest or whether they must have had some good answers for him, amen? So he's getting all these people to, together to interpret a dream, correct? Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Remember that these that we're talking about now, they worship and deal with many gods, little g. Verse 8, but at the last, last shall be first, right? We got a Hebrew here. He represents one God. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. Do you see that? What did, what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He changed their Hebrew name to what? A Babylonian name after one of their gods. And I think that's amazing that Daniel didn't commit suicide or threaten the king or anything for that. He just took the name as being in a heathen culture. And uh, let me read down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Verse 9. O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. Thus were uh, the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached on to heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and uh, it was meat for all. The beast of the field had shadow under it, and the falls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof. 
and all flesh was fed of it. I mean, what a dream. Verse 13, I saw in the vision of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. Now, you make a note of that watcher and the holy one come down from heaven, you got a good study, right? Verse 14, he cried aloud and said thus, you down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit, let the beast get away from under it and the falls from the branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones. Plural, both of them. To the intent, now look what it says here. To the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Do you see that? Who's it talking about? God. Remember, he, he puts kings in, sets them up, takes them down. He does what he wants to do. So a lot of times we get caught up, and I'm caught up with it too, with the Trump thing and hoping he can come through. And I'm telling you, if I keep thinking too much on him, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt Trump's chances. He said, what are you talking about? I'm afraid if God's people start raising him up as some kind of redeemer above what he really is, God may really do something to us. So, but what we are commanded to do is pray if we want to live peaceable upon earth here. We want to have a peaceful time. The Bible says to pray for our rulers, those in authority. <clears throat> but here we see without a doubt in this verse that the watchers and those that came down with the word of God, with this vision, said to the whole world, hey, guess what? God's in charge. He's in charge of Babylon. He's in charge of whoever's going to be in. God is in charge. And <clears throat> I'm trying to <clears throat> hurry. Verse 18, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Beltis, uh, Beltis, Belteshazzar, I used to say that very well, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, now look what it says. For the spirit of the holy gods, plural, is in thee. So Nebuchadnezzar is still thinking about his gods. And all he can do is say, you bunch them all up together. And Daniel's got the power of all of them, right? So what he should have said was the God. But he, he didn't say that in this, this deal here. Let's go over to 24. So we'll, uh, verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the King. So we're going to get the interpretation. You see the word interpretation? There are several applications of sacred scripture, but there's only one interpretation. The Holy Ghost interprets scripture with scripture to give the clear interpretation. We are taught that, 1 Corinthians 2.13. Scripture with scripture. You'll get the right interpretation. But you can use all sorts of things. You can use, uh, let me give you an example, right? Uh, I, I can do a whole thing on firemen. Now, I could probably preach a whole message on firemen. And how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to look up everything I can on firemen, see the preparations, see what they do, understand that they're the people that take care of people uh, that are in houses when they're on fire. Right, John? They're the ones that uh, are strong enough to carry bodies out, strong enough to carry their brethren out that are in there fighting the fire. I mean, they go through all this physical stuff. And so what are you getting to? I'm getting to the fact that Salvation, salvation can be, in, can be interpreted only one way. Salvation is of the Lord. But I can tell you about firemen and work my way all the way to a house that is burning and people in there screaming, and I can point you to hell where people are going to go and spend the rest of their life, and these people right now are screaming. You have to get a, vi a vision of what's going on down there so you can see people that aren't in that house right now that need the message, need the warning to get out of the house before it gets on fire. So what I'm saying is there's a whole lot of different ways you can use things, 
but it's going to come up with the same interpretation if it's scriptural. Scriptural. Verse 25. They shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. And seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas thy command to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. And when did it happen? At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. Now look what he did. Now we understand there's the interpretation and it's also a decree, this interpretation of the Most High. Uh, we know that uh, this, is, uh, this situation is pressure driven. Why? Because it's immediate. He's going to have to make a decision. There's pressure. Uh, his pride is a defeating factor and his perception has to be changed. What do you mean? Who he is and what's going on? Who? Nebuchadnezzar. Now, <laughs> we think about telling the truth. Uh, Daniel did. He gave counsel and uh, he told him to break evil habits, add righteous behavior and mercy, and he'll live at peace. That's what verse uh, 27 at the end says, a lengthening of thy tranquility. But after time, 12 months. You figure three, six, I got it in my notes, you'll probably hear it again. But you can imagine that Nebuchadnezzar's thinking he got away with everything. I mean, he heard the counsel of Daniel, right? I mean, it must have bothered him a little bit writing this, but I mean, so three months goes by. So what do you say? Hmm, got, a, got away with that. Six months. No problem. You know what Daniel told him was going to happen. And no worries, confidence. And then the year comes. At 12 months, verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that, and you always look at them pronouns, and you hear yourself talk to it to help you, that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. Uh, if you ever get a chance, I know I'm stopping, but it, it, it's, it's together with this. You get an encyclopedia. Is it called an encyclopedia? Anyway, those books that have glossy pictures, you know, of like, um, I think it's the eighth world, eighth wonders of the world or something. I think Babylon's gardens and stuff is one of them. But the artist's rendition, I don't know how factual everything is, but man, the breadth of the tops of the walls, how thick they were, they used to have chariot races. This was some kind of fantastic thing, man. I think it was probably better than Roman architecture at the time. I mean, what was going on and how they built, but man, what a, what a thing. So here you got the king. It was under him all the stuff was taken care of and built. So he's getting out of his bedroom. He's looking over and saying, man, look what I've done. See, he's forgotten about the warning, the counsel of Daniel. He's forgotten all about that. It's been a year. So apparently he wasn't paying much attention. And even though the dream scared him, after the interpretation, it seems that he forgot how scared he was. So this is where the guy's at. He's up there all healthy, all good dainty food, looking at everything all the stuff that he's done. And look at verse 31. This is how God acts. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, when it talks about, the, <laughs> we're talking about the voice of God. You had the voice of God through the prophet Daniel. Now the voice of God 
it's getting personal. When it said fell, that means instantly. You know, like when something falls, poof, you're startled. I mean, the voice of God says, boom, right when he was doing all that my and I stuff. And you start to think about that. Fell the voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. That quick. No negotiation. No explanation. <laughs> Look at verse 32. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and give it, it, give it to whomsoever he will. Now, I read all sorts of things about who's the they that grabbed them. And I'm just telling you, between me and you, since I'm doing studies on stuff in the morning, I'm saying whatever was in him moved him. So them spirits that God put in him, I guess, moved him. I bet he ran off that top, ran out there where the grass was. Done lost his mind. Now, if they would have said he just lost his mind, he ran there, fine. But it says they, the they in there. I'm like George a little bit. I look at that and they. Was that his servants? Do you actually think servants would put their hands on the king of Babylon and snatch him and take him down? Oh, God could lead them to do that. I mean, could. Or it could be some things inside moving them. Or it could even be maybe angels. I don't know. But the they, the they is there. And if you notice, he, there was no negotiation this time. All the counsel was done with Daniel at the beginning. And it all started with a nightmare. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand all that stuff. Look at verse 33. We're seeing this fulfillment here. The same hour was the, king was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And in that verse you see where it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up, it's more proof that he wrote this. He's recounting everything. Man, what a change of heart, huh? 34? Look at 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as what? Nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of where? Heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? See, that's, for, that's our God. He not only got an army in heaven, but he controls everything down here. Another verse for army in heaven, too. Verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to do what? Abase. Man. Let me go to my notes a little bit. Everybody getting that story? I don't know if you ever noticed that before. I never knew, never, 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 never. Put all that together that he wrote that. I told you before, when I go in the book, I used to go through, I look for little words like, like they and stuff like that, you know. Triggers me. But when that, I read a book in my office and the author says, that's something that he could do. A, he even did an autobiography of what went on. He says, no way. Yeah, way. You know, let it be, what is it? Let it be said, let it be written, something like that, like the pharaohs. Same thing with Nebuchadnezzar and that, when they, they would put something in law, so this is recorded somewhere. 
right here. It's recorded right here. And uh, getting into the Old Testament, the Mesoraic text, something else. But so, once again, we got Daniel in the court. God set that up. You know that Daniel was ruling that for a while, right? Seven years. Our Daniel, yeah. Heathen country, sound familiar? Yeah. Let's see, there's Joseph. Remember Joseph? Yeah. Prisoner, yeah. Brother's jealous, yeah. Boom, next thing you know, he's running the show. See, there's so many things like that that go against a lot of my brethren that say that we shouldn't belong in here or there. If you preach that God is in the affairs of men, he's in the affairs. And, and if you preach that uh, everybody that surrenders to God, God will direct them and use them, then that's what they do. Little things you can tell. Daniel never, uh, never brought uh, uh, his God low to the heathen's God. He never spoke bad. He always kept everything on the up and up. Daniel was himself. He was a prayer warrior three times a day. Uh, they knew where to get him. Remember the lion's den? Uh, so he wasn't a fake. God knows who to pick and where to put him. Uh, you and I, if he'd say, okay, Bob, uh, Trump's going to be absent. He wants you to be prez. Now, I'd probably start off wrong. You know, I can't even say what I would do because it's being recorded. But I would clean house. I could just tell you that. Everybody must go, right? And uh, where there probably wouldn't be much uh, compromise or anything like that, you know. But God knows better. God knows what I do. I'd probably make a mess out of it. Amen. So he knows what you do, too. He knows where he, he can put you and trust you. So just remember that. And uh, so we get, into, we get into chapter 4, and we, we see the retelling of the event by the king. Uh, he was told bad news. God was going to deflate his ego. The king knew from past practice that Daniel spoke for God. The king wouldn't believe him or I'm sorry, the king wouldn't believe his God had authority over him. He did believe that God spoke through Daniel, but he just didn't, somehow he couldn't get in his mind that he was king and ain't nobody over him. Daniel counseled the king to do right. We saw that and even told him, hey, you do this stuff, you're going to have peace, you're going to have tranquility. I mean, what's better than that? You can't buy that. You can't buy that. Drugs only last a little while, and you got to keep taking to maintain that. So the king made God move personally against him. I don't think I want that to happen. Sometimes as little kids, you know, they demand a whooping. You say they demand, oh yeah, they want attention from the parents. Sometimes they just do something just to get close. Sometimes daddy or mama may be working all the time or something. They want attention. So they'll do what they have to do. Christians the same way. Well, I know when I got saved, and I, I know there's a God, but it's been a long time, you know. I mean, I don't know. And you start getting skeptical. You start, you start acting out. And God allows you to do that for a while. Then he lets you know, I'm here. Those are good times. Not good how you got to them, but they're good times to know. But I'm just saying, things like that do, take, do occur. And uh, so we got... Nebuchadnezzar thought he won his, uh, he won the day, right? As the months flew by, he thought everything was okay because he thought he was in charge and God wasn't talking to him. Even though at first, the interpretation of it was explicitly him, Daniel counseled with him so we got to, some things you got to learn from this tonight. So, once again, three months, six months, then one year passed. No, one year. Right then, the king was having a self-gratifying moment. And what happened? Judgment for how long? Seven years. Not even a breather. That's like all of a sudden somebody come in here, snatch you up, throw you in prison like the January 6th guys, right? No, no, uh, no court, no nothing. You're just in there. No explanation. I mean, that feeling that you would get, you're deserted, you're left, what happened? But Nebuchadnezzar didn't have no feeling. Why? Because God changed his heart to a beast. 
He was just surviving. He was just out there acting like a bird. If you don't think that's hard to come back to, can you imagine your whole people? We're talking about the, almost the known world, George. And it's like if they had CNN there, they'd be all over that with pictures and, you know. I mean, everybody coming by, hey, look at the king. Man, look at that hair. Look at them claws. Even acting like it. Not acting himself at all. Out of his stinking mind. Man. Whew. And then it says he looked up. And when he did that, that's that time of repentance. That's when he looked up and said, you're right. I'm nothing. That's when he said, everybody in the world is nothing. <laughs> and that God's everything. And as he started off, you got to admit, it sounded almost like Paul, the way he was writing there at the beginning of the chapter. An amazing thing, but just always remember what he had uh, went through. So we consider the message. The message of God, was it confusing? No. Was it non-understandable? No, you don't understand it. Did he ignore his history with Daniel? Yes. Was the king in denial and untouchable? Yes. So the chapter is a testimony of a man's step up from pride and arrogance. And where'd he end up? Humility. So God pulls us up and places us. Our ability is dependability on God and not ourselves. Remember, God pulls us up and he places us where he wants to. So it's about our ability. And that ability is dependability because you got to be thinking about him if you want your ability to be glorified, be to his glorification. And then we, we read on and we, we start to find out some other things. Did you know that the king's, king had a son, right? Go to chapter 5. And we're not going to spend long. I say that and I look at the clock and, and I'm amazed. I'm amazed. I don't know. Sorry, guys. Go back on YouTube. Man, I was like hour and a half. I was almost like a Grady. I couldn't shut up. And uh, now it's limitation. But it seems like I got content. So I better just shut up now before I talk myself into going longer. Amen. So we got the king's son. This is after the death of his father. And uh, the thing is, he didn't learn from his father. And now that, he made a mockery of the temple things. Whoa. Serious? Yeah. You in chapter 5 there? And let's see. We'll go all over. I'm sorry. We'll go to verse 22, I believe. All right, 22 to 24. And thou, it says, And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all these things. You'd have to go through the, the beginning and find out how God dealt with his dad. And the whole problem was somebody wrote on a wall. And they, and they didn't, couldn't understand <laughs> what they had written on the wall. And we're talking about God's finger. It was God's finger that wrote on that wall. And everybody saw it being written, what he said. And so he knew that his dad counted on Daniel. He knew that Daniel was in charge. And uh, he knew that Daniel kept it in charge until this fellow here, his son, took over. And uh, anyway, so verse 22 Again, and thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods, little g, of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God, we're talking about the God, in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. That plaque was in our house on Tyreman. And so Candy's dad, when he come visit, 
You have to see that plaque every time he came in. Skeptic, agnostic, very smart, intelligent, could have been journalist, I think he wanted to. All these things, but he was Greek back in those days. It wasn't a good thing to be Greek. <laughs> they just wasn't hiring. But anyway, I can remember that. Every time I go across, I remember that being there. I can remember dad smoking. I can remember, could you imagine smoking? And then whose hand your breath is in. Man, we're praying like mad something take place. Anyway, that's what that verse reminds me of. And this is uh, what Daniel is uh, telling this boy that he's got the audacity to use the, all the uh, cups and things from the, that were stolen by Nebuchadnezzar from the temple of God that Nebuchadnezzar never touched. He may have eventually melted them down for the gold, I don't know, but he never messed with that stuff, never touched it, but his son did like a double put down, right? And verse 24, then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. So as soon as they started drinking out of those things, the hand showed up. And this is the writing that was written, many, many, uh, Tekel, uh, Parson, this is the interpretation of the thing, many, meaning, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. That's not nice. What's interesting, that many right there is mentioned twice for emphasis. So when he wrote it on the wall, he's just letting them know, hey, that's it, plus the kingdom. That's it, right? And uh, verse 27, tickle. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. In other words, there's nothing you can do about it. No kind of money, no kind of anything will we'll, uh, help you out. And then Perez means thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius, the Midian, took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Now, we, put the, we had the board out, we had Isaiah, we have the Babylon, we have the captivity, you know, uh, right after Jeremiah's preaching and all that stuff, and you get to see the progression of that. And man, when you sit back, you talking about God being in the affairs of men? You can see all of a sudden it's working to the Lord. In Babylon, I was reading, and uh, they did a lot with the roads. You know, in his kingdom, they did a whole lot with the roads. And then you had their roads for him to get to where he needed to get to the parts of his empire were being done. Then you had the Medes and the Persians. They added to that. And then the Romans finished it plus the aqueducts and all the other stuff that they had engineers to do. But you see, all that stuff's just before Jesus is born. And then Jesus, born, 33 and a half years, does what he came to do. And after that, we've got his disciples and apostles, which are the same at that time. They did, they did the signs and wonders for the Jewish people so that they would know uh, that they were sent from God and give that message to them. And the next thing you know, you see the commission of the Lord. You start to understand, well, go out to all the world. If there was no roads, if there were, all these things weren't fixed, I mean, they'd still do it. Just like we got missionaries in Ukraine and different places like that, Carth Carthage and mountains. Or anyway, they're all through there, and the roads are very treacherous. But uh, the whole world would have been like that unless these guys made roads. And they did. And why'd they do it? Because God, God is in the affairs of man. God works with the kings. God sets them up, takes them down. And we need to remember that. It's very important to remember that. So our Bible, God's Word, is a history book. 
that contains God's warnings. We read the results of those that disobeyed and those that obeyed. I mean, I got it right here in my book. <laughs> right here. Those warnings are understandable. Now, our pride gives us a decepti deceptible spirit that makes us believe we're untouchable. You know it does. You got 93-year-old men right now. Do you get up in the morning, Brother Subin, look in the mirror and say, uh, looks like I'll die today. I mean, you don't really think like that unless you're morbid, you're nuts. I mean, we don't think like that. I mean, talk to the older people, not us young guys. I mean, you wake up one day and say, I'm old. I must be like over the, you know, you, you want to know what mid, midlife crisis is. And uh, you start to say, well, what's midlife? They say 35. Where'd they get that from? Three score and 10 from the Bible? Yeah. And so you look back and say, boy, wait a minute, 35 was like a while back. That must be like midlife, must be like you get up to the top of the mountain, and now, and that's why everything goes so fast. Where'd it go? You know, but anyway, <laughs> digress. Pride, our own personal pride, keeps us from noticing just about everything. That's why humility, you have to force it on yourself for a while. Somebody says, well, if you think you got it, you don't, you know, in humility. Well, I'm telling you, you need to put yourself down. That's mortifying the flesh. That's when you think you, uh, my Nehemiah, keep praying for him because that's one of his, he is smart. He, man, whew, he's smart. And uh, therefore, he picks out stuff, you know, clinically and everything that, you know, they're, they're stupid, they're idiots. You know, I had to slow my, you just, kill that in you. Just put it down. Be humble. Because that's another stepping stone. You see, to get in a big head, you get a big head, then you, when pride takes over, you don't notice yourself as you should. You just don't. Remember that. You don't notice yourself as you really should. So pride gives us a deceptible spirit and uh, definitely will make you think you're untouchable. Our pride makes us unteachable. Not only that, and arrogant. Our prideful. <laughs> you think about, uh, man, you think about our mind, the pride in our mind. And the Lord talks about it being enmity with the Lord. And what does that mean, preacher? That means an enemy to God's thoughts. When you're not thinking about God and you're thinking about yourself and everything else, that's enmity with God. You're not retaining his thoughts. You're not thinking his way. Why, do you, why are you teaching this? Because I'm telling you, not only is the mind a terrible thing to waste, the life is a terrible thing to waste. And the hardest thing is to convince people that all their lives we told them you ought to be the best in what you do. You ought to be best in what you do for the Lord should be the full phrase but we left out the Lord so you have people pumping out and doing all sorts of things and what they do and pretty soon it's I did this I do that my 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 there's no humility it's not a good thing that aggravates me about Trump I mean acts I mean whew. he's almost real close to Muhammad Ali I am the greatest you know I can't it just bothers me anyway. Pray for your preacher about that. But pride does stuff to you. And it's doing it to you and you don't even realize it. Why? Because it's you. You're not going to self-examine like the Bible says. You're doing fine. So we've got to watch about our thoughts. Like Belshazzar, we can be careless with the responsibility God has given us. What responsibility did he give him? He gave him the kingdom. His father wrote all that stuff about the God of Daniel. He should have followed suit, submitted himself, humbled himself under that God. Instead, it was he was glad to get rid of his dad. Glad he left so he could take over and do what? Party. Party. Somebody says, history, yeah, how about Adam and Eve? You know they sinned, right? 
What happened? They, they ruined the entire race, all right? That's, that was the outcome. How about David? Murder? Lied? Probably some more stuff if you want to look at it. You think about Abraham. He definitely lied. Moses? We won't even count the murder because I'm just sort of like... Anyway, but he smote the rock twice. Remember that? Sure you do. Jeremiah refused to preach. Do you remember that? I will not preach again. And the word in him was a stirring and a burning. But that's disobedience, isn't it? And then you got Jonah, my goodness. We always laugh, Whale University. And we think that he got a degree from Whale University. No, it just scared him to death, right? I mean, he was went down to hell, probably. The gates were there. And uh, come up, and he was all acid cleaned, right? Probably pale. Being Asian, being, you know, being a Jew out there in the sun, he was probably nice and golden crisp, maybe even real dark. Come out of that well, man. I don't know if him preaching or, or him, he scared the junk out of Nineveh. I don't know. But I know they all repented. They all repented, including the kids. He didn't care one iota about that. And at the end of the book, you ought to read it. Where's Jonah? Who knows? Price he paid for what? Disobedience. God told him to do it, not think about it. That's why you never know. The people that you hate the most or whatever, God does stuff. He can set you up with somebody that you really don't like. And that Holy Spirit will be working on you for you to witness. And you're saying to yourself, I'm letting them go to hell. I just don't. And if that keeps your heart beating faster and faster, you need to listen to God. You need to witness. Why? I don't know what he'll do. I know it's not going to be pleasant. You got... You got history after Bible history. What did they do? How did they make it right? What did it cost them for doing it? Remember, remember Achan and his whole family? Would you have done that? Would you have killed a man and his whole family over a garment and some stuff? See, it wasn't the garment and the stuff. It was God said not to. Because the next battle, guess what they got? The spoil. If, if Achan would have just waited, he would have got to spoil the next battle. What a waste. He killed his whole family because of his disobedience. I mean, here in our historical autobiography, it tells a whole lot about human nature, the results. God was merciful with Nebuchadnezzar. He wasn't with his son. Beware of not knowing history. You know the expression. What we learn from history is we don't learn from history. If you want real history, that King James Bible is real history. I mean, this is the history book. They don't even, they don't even want to let you know how many things they found because of this book. They don't even want to let you know all the battles that West Point and everybody studied in this Bible. They don't want you to know that the psychologists and everything went through Proverbs and everything and, and uh, learned about man way back yonder. <laughs> and you read it and you read it and it gets in you. What gets in you? The book gets in you. That's why you got to read it. If you can't read like John's got a problem, get, get some way to, my goodness, to uh, hear it or something. And just listen every day. Because it gives you power. It's manna. It is spiritual food. And so tonight, Nebuchadnezzar's 